Hi, welcome to the next session as part of your subject training program in English. Uh, my name's Nathan Corfey. Uh, I'm part of the uh, NET English Director team. Um, and what we're going to be focusing on in this session is structure, uh, order and structure of texts uh, and how we can analyze uh, structure and how we can use that in the classroom. So first, let's go through the aims of this session. What we want to be doing in this session is essentially demystify structure. We want to take away that element of the unknown, uh, perhaps of, of, the, of the scary when it comes to teaching structure, because ultimately, when a lot of us were in school, uh, structure wasn't something that was explicitly taught. Uh, we were taught language and structure as one entity. Uh, it's only recently that exam boards have required us to teach language and structure as something very separate. And so for us, it can seem daunting as teachers in terms of teaching this. We're fine with the language, we can get on with that. It's the structure that often scares us. We wanna demystify that and we want to help both staff and students realize it's not only something that's um, so useful in our analysis of literature, but is actually something really engaging as well. And so we're gonna be answering questions or at least hoping to answer questions like, what is structure exactly? Uh, what are those fundamental structural elements in a text? What are the building blocks that make up structure? Uh, what are the things we should be looking for? Um, how can students identify these structural techniques? Then how can they explain and evaluate them successfully? And finally, how do we make teaching structure uh, engaging, exciting for students and for staff so that it's something that we're no longer uh, fearful of, of doing, but actually we realize that we're doing it anyway and we just wanna make that explicit. So those are the aims of our session uh, today. Okay, so first, what is structure exactly? What do we mean when we use this word structure? But what we essentially mean is the shape of a story. And, you know, at its very basic level, uh, very primary school level, we're looking at beginning, middle and end. Uh, we don't want to overcomplicate that. Uh, we just want to look at the, the way uh, the, the text is sequenced. Uh, and actually, AQA did flirt with the word sequence when they came up with their structure question. Initially, they were going to call it, um, how is the writer sequence the text? And they've actually said in the past that it might be more helpful to think of it with that word. And I think they're right. The word structure often is the, the daunting part. If you think about the word sequence, it's just how events link together and why events link together. Why do we start here in a, in a kind of dark forest? Uh, how does that connect to the later tension? Um, why does the, the, the extract end with a scene uh, in a castle, in a very dark room? And how does that link to the initial opening? We're just essentially linking events and seeing why the writer's done that. AQA, the exam board um, that so many of us study, uh, say it's often helpful to think of it having a cinematic overview of a text. So really, what they mean is thinking of it like a movie, thinking of it uh, as a film sequence. And if you're familiar with film or you've ever studied film, then teaching structure will be very easy for you because it's the same thing. You think about your wide opening, you're zooming into certain aspects of a scene or uh, of a character. And why do we do that? And once you start thinking that way and you start changing your thinking, uh, it'll become very, very easy for you to uh, analyze structure and to teach the analysis of structure as well. Okay, so now we know what structure is. Let's look for the kind of structural elements you might find in a text. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. These are just kind of the basics and the bare bones of what we might expect to see. Uh, and so you can see on the screen there, there's a number of uh, different ones you could look at. And for each of them, I've included an icon. Uh, and the reason I do that is often this helps students to remember them and they can associate that technique with that particular icon. So let's start with um, immediately establishes there at the top right. Immediately establish is something that every text is going to do. Every text is going to immediately establish something. They might immediately establish, you know, the, the poverty of Harry Potter in the opening page. They might uh, immediately establish the heroic stature 
um, of a character. They might immediately establish a sense of something like a sense of darkness or a sense of excitement. But every single writer will do that. And that's something that's an easy win for students. There will always be something immediately established. Something else that uh, is often the case is that the, uh, the writer will withhold information. They won't tell us everything, obviously. They won't tell us Harry Potter has secret magical powers and lives. What they'll actually do is feed us little bits to make us want to find out why that is. So that's another thing we could add there as well. One of the other things we can have is a focus shift. And again, every text will do this because whenever there's a new paragraph, there's often a shift in focus. We're either focusing on a different character or a different place. And so we want to find those two. Uh, other things we might have is a narrowing focus, which is other people call it zooming in. I think narrowing focus just sounds a little more technical. Uh, but when we zoom into something, uh, we narrow into a character, we narrow into a scene, we might have a wide open description of the forest, and then we might narrow the focus to a single tree, therefore realizing that this is an important tree. Uh, equally, you can have a widening focus as well, and uh, moving out from the scene or the character. Another thing we might find is flashbacks where we move back in time and often those are there to kind of show us uh, the journey of a character or perhaps to show symmetry between two events in time. Uh, we might have internal thoughts, which is actually um, another structural technique where we hear what the character's thinking. Um, not on this screen, but pathetic fallacy is actually a structural technique. So anytime we have a mention of weather, uh, we can write about that. And again, that's often at the beginning. We often get setting of the scene. And as we know, it's dark and stormy. We're getting a, immediately establishing a sense of danger. Um, you may also find a cyclical structure, which is where the opening is referred to in the closing. And you get this sense of symmetry again in the text. Uh, AQA as an example would love using that. You'll find that a lot in the examples they give. Uh, and you may also find as well motifs. And a motif is kind of like an extended metaphor. It's when you get an image or a symbol, maybe a color throughout a text, and it'll be there for a reason. So for example, if we're getting the color red throughout, perhaps it's foreshadowing danger uh, later on in the text. So those are kind of some essentials, as I said, they're not an exhaustive list, but what I'll do, and this is something you can do with students as well, uh, is uh, I'll now mix them up and remove one and you've got to think which one has been removed so have a look at what's there now one's going to go in a minute see if you can uh, work out which one it is and then if this was a class we would then explain that particular technique and why it's there okay so one is now missing we've shuffled them around and um, see if you can work out which one it is i will give you exactly five seconds for that Okay, so you should have worked out that it's actually flashback that's missing. And this is a nice kind of um, starter activity you can do with a class because you can go through, they, they quite enjoy this. Uh, and if they know which one it is, they have to then explain uh, what it is. You may also have a text in front of them and they need to identify where it is. Perhaps you might ask them why a writer might use that technique. So we don't just want to leave it with the identifying of techniques. We want to also be explaining them and discovering them as well. OK, so we've talked about um, identifying them, um, but how do we explain them? Uh, and that's often a question we get. Students can find these things, but uh, what do they do with them? Uh, well, we'll go through the do's and don'ts. We'll start with the don'ts. Um, don't just feature spot. So don't just find them and leave it there. And students often feel very proud of themselves because they found where a, a writer has withheld information or they found a focus shift. And they just write, the writer has used a focus shift. We've always got to ask why. Uh, ideally, why and then why else? But there always needs to be a reason for that. Otherwise, there's no mark there. Um, don't just give generalized explanations. Don't just say things like, this makes us want to read on because every text is meant to make us read on. Uh, this makes the reader think. What does it make us think? Uh, this gives us a picture in our head. What is the picture in your head? You know, be specific and have your students. Don't just accept that as an answer, whether it's verbal or written. Always, you know, push them further for, OK, what is that image? Um, what is the emotion it makes you feel? You know, that's where we start uh, to get our marks. And that's where we start really thinking about the structure of a text. 
And finally, don't use overcomplicated terminology. Don't feel you have to go, uh, you know, ranging through the internet, finding these really obscure words that sound clever. Um, that doesn't really do anything for the student. What, where the mark is and um, it, it is when they're explaining well. And often, the clearer the explanation, the better. So when we overcomplicate it with words like anaphora and others, which I won't mention, because if I do, we'll all go on Google looking them up, um, it doesn't help anybody stick to the basics it's what they do with that that matters and so those are the don'ts of when we're explaining structural terminology okay now for the do's then uh, so firstly do give specific explanations so as we said you wouldn't say uh, this makes us want to read on instead this makes us want to discover why the mother's homeless we're being specific to the text and to the details in the text. This makes us ask questions like, give an example of a question, how could this character feel so helpless? Um, this makes us want to read on to discover why the um, dinosaur uh, has finally found the egg. That's a really bad example. Uh, but you want to get them to be specific with those explanations and that's when they start really engaging. Um, do also explore multiple interpretations. And this is great for when you're doing your questioning as well. Don't just accept the first answer and give them a massive uh, applause moment. Say, okay, great. Now what else? Particularly with top sets, you know, how else could this be interpreted? Why else does the reader establish a sense of, of foreboding at the start? Why else do we shift from the, the C to the small boy? And as we do that, students will start to understand that they need to be exploring and expanding in their answers and key words for that would be words like also which indicates i'm going to say something else and then perhaps and maybe which is our kind of our spect speculative language our modal verbs which uh, kind of uh, indicate that we're going to be speculative in our ideas and that's when we really start to get some high level uh, thought in there as well and finally do make connections across the text remember that keyword sequence we're thinking about the order of those events so keywords like earlier and later maybe foreshadowing uh, so for example this links to the earlier description of the child's poverty so by using the words earlier and later we're training students that they should be ranging around the text and making those links between the sequence of events and therefore they're truly analyzing the structure of a piece of text. Okay, so let's look at an example uh, and see how we might do that. So this is a great extract for structure. This extract is from the opening of the novel It by Stephen King. Uh, there's also a good movie adaptation uh, and the movie adaptation is almost identical um, to the opening of the novel. So it's a great one to use in class. Uh, and so in this part of the text, a young boy chases his papered boat down the gutters. Now, we wouldn't analyze anything there because that's just an explanation of the text. What we would analyze is that opening line. The terror, which would not end for another 28 years, even if it did end, began so far as I know or can tell with a boat made from a single sheet of newspaper floating down a gutter swollen with rain. Straight away, there's so much we can analyze here. Opening with the terror immediately establishes a sense of danger and foreboding. So we can you know, link onto that immediately. Um, we get that which would not end for another 28 years. Here, the, the writer's withholding information. We're now thinking, well, what happens in between that time? That's a long time. So um, what actually goes on with this elongated sense of terror? Uh, then we get um, immediately establishes this boat made with a single sheet of newspaper. Now, you could start to pick that apart and say, OK, well, why do we have a boat here? What's immediately established with this boat? The fact that it's fragile. So we get a sense of fragility. So, you know, is this going to link to the later fragility of the character? So we can start looking at that. And then finally, in that sentence, we get swollen with rain. Um, now, the temptation would be to analyze the word swollen. And we want to talk about, you know, imagery of disease. But this isn't language. We stick to structure. But pathetic fallacy is structure. So we could talk about rain and, uh, you know, the fact that the, the rain could be giving us a sense of depression, uh, darkness uh, and a moody kind of opening. So we could start there. And then we get the boat bobbed, listed, righted itself again, dived bravely through the tre treacherous whirlpools and continued on its way down Witcham Street towards the traffic, which marked the intersection of Witcham and Jackson. 
long sentence. Uh, but here we could argue that there's a, a narrowing of focus. We've already mentioned the boat, but now we're narrowing the focus to this boat. And again, what is important about this boat? Why does King decide that this is the thing we're going to focus on? Could it be the journey it's going on? The fact that it's meandering uh, the fact that it could emulate the journey of the boy later in the text, if you've read it before. So we could look at that as well. And there's all sorts of other things we can look at in this text. This is a great one. Uh, we get um, this color yellow all the way through. And if you have a read of this, I'll try and make this available um, so you can have this for your classes or for your own perusing. But we do have the color yellow throughout. And perhaps that could represent danger, could represent disease, like a kind of corruption. Uh, and so lots and lots of things we could pick out. And that's really what you want to be showing students. And you certainly want to be modeling that. As soon as a student sees you doing it, they'll understand how they can do it. And their answers will be infinitely better because of it. OK, so once uh, the students have analyze the text and you've had that exploration and that can be quite exciting for students oh i found this and i found that how then do you take that and write a response well on the screen here is an example of what you could use this again is not something that's um, definitive it's just an example um, but you want to be thinking about the start of the text uh, the middle of the text and the end of the text so here's a few sentence openers that could be used so at the start of the text the writer immediately establishes uh, a sense of danger uh, or the writer purposefully withholds information about the terror that takes place for the next 28 years. And then in the green boxes, this is where we start to explain. The writer may have done this to uh, create a sense of um, tension, to accentuate the fragility of the character, um, to cause the reader to ask questions like, what terror inflicts this town? And then finally, in the yellow boxes, how do we link that? This initially interests the reader since we understand how innocent the character is in comparison to the later corruption that takes place. This maintains the reader's interest since um, we are um, intrigued as to the importance of this boat and how it links to whatever it might be. So this is one way you could do it. And it's one way particularly of aiding students who are less able and need that scaffolding. So this is something you can be using in your classes should you need to. OK, so let's look at an example together of what this might look like in practice. So on the left hand side here, I've put a progress counter. And this is something, again, you could be using with classes to help them write their responses and to help them self assess them or peer assess them. And so from the bottom, working our way up, we start with I've begun my response with identifying structural device. Uh, then I've used a short embedded quotation. Then I've clearly explained. So you can see the peel structure coming out here. Uh, I've explained in detail. So we're, we're using um, kind of multiple interpretations. I've linked different parts of the text to my response. And finally, I've linked it to key concepts, maybe concepts you've been learning in class, not just in language lessons, but literature as well. So again, that's really just the peel structure. And you'll see that in the example here. So this is an example from a different text, uh, but it's from the opening. That we're analyzing so it says at the start of the extract the writer immediately establishes a sense of shock again that's easy we can all find a sense of something just plot in the emotion in the opening phrase i looked out the window and saw mum rooting for the dumpster so nice embedded quote there the writer uses a contrast with the narrator thinking they are overdressed for the evening emphasizing how different their lives are this interests the reader since we long to discover the reason for their separation even the narrator's apathy towards her. Also, so we know that we're exploring in more detail, the writer's use of pathetic fallacy, another structure device, with the dark and cold could foreshadow the later tone of the extract as the events become more sinister. Now you can see as this answer goes on, it gets better and better. We start by identifying something, then we explain it kind of briefly then we explain in more depth or another viewpoint on it and finally we link it and that link is vital and that's a good example of how we might do it now you can do it um, for the middle and the end as well you might also do an overview or throughout the text paragraph but that's really what we'd be looking for for students uh, to make sure they're successful in analyzing structure okay so how can we make uh, the teaching of structure, something that's engaging for students 
um, and staff as well. Um, I think it is a bit of a myth that structure is boring um, and difficult to teach. I think once you understand the the basic fundamentals, it actually adds a little bit of something extra into your, te into your teaching rather than the same old uh, language teaching. And so there's a number of different things we can use. One is uh, video clips. As we've mentioned before, the exam board AQA even uh, discussed themselves about how um, the teaching of structure is very similar to the teaching of media and film study. So actually, we could and should be using film clips to kind of support our teaching of structure. We can look at the structure of a certain scene and then we can look at that scene as it's written in a novel. So one great place to go for that would be um, film adaptations from novels, looking at a scene um, in the movie and then comparing it to uh, an extract would be a great way to start, particularly to engage students. Uh, and then all you need to do really is just change the word camera to focus, get your students to understand that that's really what we're trying to do. And what you will find is students who studied media are very, very good at structure because they're used to doing that. Uh, another thing you can use is kind of quick mini whiteboard quizzes. So um, assessing their knowledge of the structure techniques, um, assessing their ability to identify different structure techniques within a text can be something that can be done in 30 second interactive whiteboard quizzes. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment so you can see how you could run that. Uh, and finally, not to just teach structure in isolation. Don't just have one or two lessons focusing specifically on structure, making sure that that's interleaved and interweaved throughout the curriculum and that we're constantly referring back to structure so that students are able to do the same thing. They understand that structure is a part of everything. All writing, um, all reading will have some element of structure in it as well. So we can get them to spot it, not just in different texts, uh, not just in different lessons, but also in different media types as well. So I'll, what I'll do is I'll show you some examples now of how you could do that. So we're going to start with a film clip um, from Hunger Games. My face is going to leave the screen, thankfully. Um, so you'll just hear my voice. And what we'll do is we'll go through the, the clip um, part by part, and I'll kind of discuss it as if I was discussing it with a class uh, in terms of the structure devices that you might find in that clip. Okay, so the scene opens with a focus on this character Effie Trinket. We're immediately establishing the lavishness of this character, the decadence of this character. Look at her makeup, almost the ridiculousness of her as well. The, the makeup for us as an audience uh, or a reader, we'd see as being a little bit over the top. Um, and so it, it represents the kind of extravagant nature perhaps of characters in the capital. So let's watch on. Now notice that we shift focus from the character Effie Trinket to the, the, the crowd in front of her and we'll continually shift focus like this and the reason is that the writer or the director wants to establish the contrast between these two. Uh, we've got the immediately establishing the lavishness of Effie Trinket, contrasting with the poverty of these children. Look at their faces. You know, Effie Trinket was excited and excitable. These are obviously nervous and fearful. And also look at the clothing, very plain, lots of greys, um, lots of whites, and perhaps the white could represent the purity. Uh, of these young people as they go into uh, into battle. One courageous young man and woman for the honor of representing District 12 in the 74th annual Hunger Games. Now notice how close the camera is. We really are zooming in. Now, if this was a text which you'll read later, uh, obviously it goes into a lot of description about her. And again, that is really because we want to dive into the character herself and what she's feeling. Uh, and, and we want to see it through both their eyes and her eyes. So we can see a contrast in how they experience this scene. As usual, ladies first. And obviously the camera now is zooming in on her hand as she reaches uh, for the name. Now obviously this is building tension and it's about the selecting the hand. Now the hand could be important as well because obviously hands can represent all sorts of different things. Um, she's obviously got um, nail varnish on representing again her lavishness but also the selection, the grasping, the kind of 
the fact that this whole scene is about selecting someone and picking them out. Um, so we've got that motif perhaps of hands, which could also represent humanity, you know, joining hands together uh, and the isolation of these characters. Now she holds up the paper here. The paper could be symbolic as well. If you've watched the, the movie analysis of the movie It, we had opened with a fragile paper, the paper representing the fragility of the boy. Perhaps here the paper could represent the fragility of the, the teenagers in this scene, particularly of Primrose, which is Katniss's sister. Now again, notice how quiet it is in this scene, obviously creating tension and writers will do similar things. Um, but as well, notice that we've now zoomed out. Uh, we can see on the stage all the kind of important people and notice how they're distanced from the the normal people there. The, uh, the teenagers are at a distance and we've also got the guards here. So visually, we're seeing a separation and writers will do that same thing with the imagery that they use as well. Obviously, the camera will zoom in on Primrose. Look how close we are to her reaction. We're looking at her facial expression here because we want to capture the fear and shock in her face. And then the camera will continually shift, or the focus, if we're writing this, will shift from uh, Katniss to Primrose, from sister to sister, to show their connection as well. Now the focus is moving with the character because we're meant to empathize with this character. So the focus shifts along with her on a journey, uh, but also notice the innocence. We've got the white uh, here for the uh, representing her purity. She's wearing pigtails, again, representing her youth and her innocence. Look at as well that the, the focus is zooming in on her, tucking in uh, her shirt, showing just how inexperienced she is and how she's not ready for this task that she's supposed to endure. The focus then shifts to a mother, again to show the contrast in reaction. The mother stands stoic, she doesn't do anything. We can see it from a facial expression. Obviously she's upset, but she doesn't feel capable. And that contrasts with the later expression and reaction of Katniss Primrose's sister. Okay, so now obviously the camera will and the focus will shift on to Katniss at this point. But notice as well, that from a cinematic point of view, the camera is very shaky, which could represent the kind of rawness of this scene, almost like it's inexperienced, almost like a documentary. Writers will do similar things as well. They might use realistic depictions to create a sense of realism rather than a sense of fantasy. So the writer look out for aspects of realism. Now, we don't want to write about language, we want to write about, write about structure, but think about how the focus shifts here in a very jolty way. Way, which the writer may also do. And then we finish here with the focus zooming onto the sisters embracing, again showing their, their closeness uh, and again showing um, the kind of from the earlier separation that they had in the crowd, now they're close together because of Katniss's sacrifice. So lots and lots of structural devices that we could pick out from this particular scene. So that scene that we've just watched on the screen here is the extract from the novel of that scene. So again, this is something you can do with the students. Watch the scene, analyze the scene, look at the camera and the focus shifts, then come to a piece of text and have them write about it. And that way they're far more engaged in the text because they've already watched it. Uh, and there's many different um, movie adaptations you can use for this. Hunger Games is a great one. As we've seen before, Stephen King's It is a good one. Um, 
Jurassic Park is another good one. There's plenty on there. And what I'll try to do is put on the drive where you've accessed this video um, some examples that you could be using with your classes as well. But here's an example of an extract. Um, we've put some line numbers in as well to help them find uh, the, the the correct part of the text that they want to be analysing. And again, it's a really good way of into the text and into the teaching of structure too. So I mentioned as well about mini whiteboard quizzes, which is a good thing you can do, particularly at starters. Uh, here's an example on the screen here. So text connector, where you have a, a section of text appearing on the screen and students need to identify how the opening and the middle of the text are connected. So do we have a shift in focus? Uh, do we have a narrowing of focus? Uh, do we have a motif that perhaps links things together? Uh, is there a contrast? And so on the screen on the blue boxes there, are some examples of the kind of things students might be writing about. They'd write it on the whiteboard and after those 30 seconds you might then quiz the students, well why do you think uh, uh, this um, this structure device is being used, where do we see it etc. So I'll show you an example of a piece of text now and you can see how we might use that in a, in a lesson context. Okay, so we have two uh, pieces of text here. The first would be the opening. The second box would be the, the middle of the text. So the forest was silent. All around us, the trees watched on with disgust as we dug the grave. Mounds of earth formed on the wet soil as worms weaved in and out in preparation for their slow feed. Only the body had eyes closed. So again, we might, if we were looking at openings, discuss how the, what's immediately established is a sense of, um, uh, of kind of, um, of darkness, um, of violence, um, of the Gothic, if you want to link it back to, to what they studied in year seven. So we might start with that. And let's look at the middle. Blood streaked the flesh as we hauled him in. A hard packing sound of skin on hard earth echoed through the trees. We couldn't look on anymore, tried to close our eyes, but we couldn't. We would sleep no more. So what you might put there is the fact that we zoom in um, onto the body itself. Um, you could have a focus shift from the forest uh, to the um, to the person, you could have the motif of eyes throughout, perhaps feeling like they're not being noticed. So what I would do if this was a, a class was I would read them both out first, then have the students write on their whiteboards, and then we discuss it afterwards. And so that's one way in. You could also, of course, just quiz them with um, uh, structure devices. What is the structure device used here? Um, there's many different ways in that you can use to make the teaching of structure a little more interesting for, for both students and yourself. Okay, so just to summarize uh, what we've been through in this session, essentially uh, the teaching of structure is about the shape of the narrative and the, the kind of order and sequence of a text. Um, that's what we should be looking for, how events link together. And part of that is characterization as well, how a character might develop. Um, it's also to do with the setting and the weather. All these things come into structure and that should make us feel a little more at ease as English teachers. It's the kind of stuff we're used to. Um, the kind of things we'd be looking for would be the shifts in focus, uh, narrowing or widening of the focus. Uh, we might look for cycles. Uh, we might look for motifs. Um, we might look at what's immediately established at the start of a text. But the most important thing is that students can say why that's used and also link events to earlier and later events. And that is what we're really looking for. The, the, the essential peel paragraph works really well for structure. And in terms of teaching structure, uh, as we've said before, uh, film clips are a great way into this. It's a great way for to um, begin a discussion with students about structure and then moving into related extracts as well, uh, maybe using interactive whiteboard activities as well to make that more engaging for students. Hopefully, um, some of what we've talked about here will be useful for you. Of course, if you've got any uh, questions or you want access to any of the materials, um, do email me and I'll get those through to you or talk to the head department at your academy and I'm sure we can organize that to, to take place for you. Uh, thanks so much for taking part in this session uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions as part of this program.